Okay, the vast majority of us wrestle with change in some way. Either we wrestle with changes that surround us, wrestle with changes that surround us, such as ending the semester, graduating, changing our residence, uh, even getting married. Even good changes can, can be a source of, of stress or fear. Um, or we, we might wrestle with implementing positive changes in our personal life. Implementing positive changes in our personal life. Such as, how are all these external changes going to impact my spiritual life? Or um, how am I going to transition where I am as a person to where I want to be? So this is the last week of class, which means that change is coming. Change is coming. Throughout our lives, change is going to happen in us and around us. Christian and business leadership author John Maxwell said, change is inevitable, growth is optional. Change is inevitable, growth is optional. And change is a blessing from God. It's a normal part of life, it's not to be feared. And God brings us seasons of change into our lives so that we can have growth opportunities. God brings us seasons of change into our lives so we can have growth opportunities. It's not automatic, it's not guaranteed, like John Maxwell said, um, but when there's a change, whether that change is initiated externally or internally, it provides the opportunity to grow. Changes in season are natural. Uh, listen to what King Solomon said about seasons and times. Let's uh, look at Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. We got the battery changed on the mic. So, up front. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. Ecclesiastes is right after Psalms and Proverbs. It's written by King Solomon, who God blessed him to be the wisest person who ever lived. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. All right, if that reminded you of a 1960s song, it's because it was based on, on this passage. Um, Maybe, if you think through some of the things on that list, maybe we're good at keeping the peace. But when we wilt, when it comes time to confront something or even to fight for what's right, maybe we're, we've confused love with niceness and all acceptingness. Um, and we fail to hate the evil and the sin that God hates. Maybe we're good at speaking or at keeping silent, but what about both at their proper time? Are we willing to change to embrace the season that we're in? Are we willing to change to embrace the season that we're in? Here's another quote from John Maxwell. It's a, it's a longer quote. Change is scary. Change is hard. It requires us to toss aside the familiar and jump headlong into the unknown. And change can be rife with failure as we experiment with new ideas until we hit the right mix to jumpstart our engines. But change does not have to be so daunting. The problem is our expectations of a quick and easy fix derail us. We think there ought to be some sort of magic. If we try something new, it'll automatically improve our situations. When it doesn't, we often give up, hope the problem goes away, or keep working harder at a solution that clearly isn't working. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, Verses 51 and 52. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. 
Behold, I chew a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, where the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptibly, we shall be changed. All right. This passage is about the rapture, but it represents most people's expectation of change. We want to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We want it to be done. Uh, and, and God will one day instantly and permanently change us for eternity. But until Jesus returns, change is a process that we have to experience. Until Jesus returns, change is a process that we have to experience. And so how do we make that process fruitful uh, rather than fearful and frustrating? Well, it really is a process. And, and we're going to go through seven short steps uh, of that process tonight. So seven steps to make change a fruitful process. Seven steps to make change a fruitful process. And, and these seven steps fit into two main categories. Uh, the first is section one. The first four steps fit under section one. And so you got Roman number one is transforming my thinking. Transforming my thinking. And the first step within that is uh, number one, recognize the potential fruit. Recognize the potential fruit. Let's look at Luke 13, verses six through nine. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. All right. It, it if we don't see potential fruit um, for that, if that positive outcome, we're not going to put in the work to make the change. And, uh, or, or we're not going to embrace an external change in a healthy way. For example, I will soon be preparing our garden spot at our house for this year's garden. And that will be a big change of the current state of the ground right there. And uh, it'll involve a lot of work. Um, I'll need to, to purchase and haul some composted manure. Uh, I'll have to till up the ground and, and work the new dirt into that. I'll have to purchase plants and seeds to, to put into the ground. Uh, I'll have to weed it and water it throughout the summer. Um, I'm, I'm going to do all that because my family and I like homemade salsa, among other things that we get out of the garden. And, uh, but if I can't visualize the fruit, I'm not gonna put in all the work to do that, to, to make that change in the ground. So change has a cost. Change has a cost. If we can't visualize the return on our investment, we won't get past the comfort of keeping things the same. If we can't visualize the return on our investment, we won't get past the comfort of keeping things the same. Even if we know things aren't as good, it's still comfortable to keep things the way they are. So we have to know that there's a good fruit to, to put in the work to change. Um, for example, think of the fruit this fall at the end of the summer. If we, uh, the fruit of closeness and in tuneness with God, if each of us spent a good quality time with God each day between now and when we get back in the fall. There, there would be a lot of fruit there. Um, now that would either require a change in our personal lives, because we're not doing that now, or it would require us to maintain that discipline even though our schedule is going to go through a upheaval change in the next few weeks. So spiritual disciplines involve work and that's why we have to 
visualize the benefit of, of the outcome be, before we start that change. So step two, believe the possibility of change. Believe the possibility of change. Matthew 22, 33 says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. Um, in the short parable we read in uh, step number one, why did the gardener ask to work the ground around the tree and to fertilize it? He, he did that because he believed he could turn the tree into a good fruit producing tree. So let's look at the next three verses together. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, then Mark 10, 27, Philippians 4, 13. demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and you take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Yet it was good for you to share. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Thank you. <clears throat> um, if it's a godly, positive change that we're seeking, we need to believe that God will empower us to make that change. And we can begin to change our thinking through prayer. We can begin to change our thinking through prayer. Even if we've had a negative bent and a negative way of thinking about something our whole life, God can still change that. We can partner with God to change our feelings by changing our thinking. We can partner with God to change our feelings by changing our thinking. That doesn't, that doesn't happen by thinking one positive thought. It, it, it takes more than, than one thought. It happens by consistently putting the right thoughts into our head until our mindset is changed. It happens by consistently putting the right thoughts into our head until our mindset is changed. Again, if we don't believe that healthy change is possible, we're not gonna put the effort into making the change to do our part. Step three, uh, adjust our expectations. Adjust our expectations. Um, it's not going to be that instant, complete process that we all wished that it was. Uh, we're not going to reach perfection this side of heaven, so when we make a change, we shouldn't expect it to solve all our problems and fix, magically fix everything. Our goal um, for each change should be improvement, not perfection. Uh, our goal for each change should be improvement, not perfection. A step in the right direction, not the finish line. And even though we may believe the outcome uh, is where we should be or, or where we're meant to be, the change itself isn't going to feel natural. Even, even if that's where we're supposed to be, it's not going to feel natural. Uh, here's another quote from John Maxwell. Change should feel awkward. Change should feel awkward. Intellectually, we know that change means things will be different, yet for some reason we expect it to be comfortable. Let's get real. If change doesn't feel a little weird, it's not really change. And, and we can go into it with that mindset. That expectation is going to be very helpful. Also, even though uh, we believe an outcome of a change might be better than where we are, uh, some, in some situations we still might feel a loss over where we've been. Um, it's okay to grieve the loss, the loss of a past season. Just don't let that stand in the way of the new one. It's okay to grieve the loss of a past season. Just don't let that stand in the way of a new one. 
Um, for example, someday you might move into a, a newer, nicer, bigger house. But the house where you've been might have a lot of memories to it. So it's okay to grieve the loss and mourn the loss of the old place, but don't let that, um, after you've done that, embrace the new place. Step number four, take ownership. Take ownership. Um, if you want to enjoy the fruit, you're the one who needs to make the change. Um, as badly as the staff wishes we could sometimes make decisions for, for people, we can't. We have to make our own decisions. And we have to make our own changes. Um, your changes are up to you. And here are a couple passages uh, about our responsibility to change our thinking. Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, and then Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So the first one, Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be new in the attribute of your mind. And to, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. I am the one responsible for renewing my mind and making changes so I can be in God's will. I'm the one responsible for renewing my mind and making changes so I can be in God's will. No one else can do that to me. But we, we should partner with God with that, but another human can't make those changes, can't make those decisions for you. So, these are the, the first four steps had to do with transforming our thinking. Uh, the steps in main section number two are about transforming our actions. So that's Roman numeral number two, is transforming my actions. And then step number five, take initiative before the ideas expire. Take initiative before the ideas expire. Another quote from John Maxwell, ideas have a short shelf life. You must act on them before the expiration date. Have you ever read an amazing book or heard an amazing sermon and thought, that is a great concept, that is going to change my life, and then nothing happens, N nothing changes? Um, has anyone experienced that? Yeah. Um, and, and when, why do most sermons and books and retreats and mission trips leave most people unchanged? The answer, when an idea motivates us but nothing changes, is because we fail to implement changes in our life before the idea is expired. Let's look at Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. While well, well, they're looking that up, let me just go back to that. When we hear a great concept, the reason why nothing changes is because we don't apply it immediately. Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as, wise, uh, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. All right. So, um, is that NIV? Yes. You said uh, every opportunity. Some of the other translations use the word time. The, mm -hmm. the Greek word there um, is for that verb is kairos. And uh, there are a number of words for time. It's not a verb, but noun. Um, there are a number of words for time in Greek, uh, a couple of those. One is chronos, as in chronological time, um, measurable time. Clock time. That, that's chronos. Uh, but kairos 
is more about a moment when something changed. It, it's independent of chronos time. It, it's, it's when time seems to stand still. Time doesn't matter because this is an important moment. Um, so Ephesians 5 is talking about the Kairos time. So it, Ephesians 5 tells us to make the most of Kairos moments. There, there is a moment, there's a window of opportunity that we should act on something or else the moment's going to pass and we're going to miss it. Um, for example, Cycle to Campus is coming up. Um, many of us probably think like that would be a good opportunity to serve and to support this ministry of God's. Uh, but thinking it's a good idea is only the first step. If we don't translate that into action within a given amount of time, the opportunity is going to pass. Uh, another example is a blacksmith. If a smith wants to change the shape of a hard metal, he, he puts it in the fire until the metal gets red hot, and then he has to apply his hammer to it before it cools off. Uh, if he waits too long, he'll have to reheat the metal. And this is the same with, the, it's true with any idea for positive change. Even if, it's, even if there's not a specific expiration date attached to it, if we don't strike while the iron is hot, our motivation will cool and we'll have to start the process over. If we don't strike while the iron is hot, our motivation will cool and we'll need to start the process over. So step number six is make adjustments. Make adjustments. And this goes back to the expectation step. Um, remember, we're looking for improvement, not perfection, not immediate results. And uh, we should expect hiccups along the way when we're changing something and trying something new. Um, and when we try to make positive, godly changes in our lives, one of those hiccups we should expect is spiritual warfare. Let's look at Romans 7, verses 21 through 25. Romans 7, verses 21 through 25. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So that's talking about having the desire to do something good, do something new, and, and there's going to be obstacles, and, and spiritual warfare is part of that. As we try our hand at something new, we'll probably come across an obstacle we didn't anticipate, or, or we may come across a way to modify it and improve the change that we're trying to make, make it better. Uh, we, we shouldn't expect that we'll just happen to stumble on the perfect way of doing something the first time we're trying it. So uh, we need to make adjustments, and that should be part of our expectations. So step number seven, reinforce the change through repetition. Reinforce the change through repetition. Uh, I mentioned in, in step two, but having one positive thought isn't going to change our mindset or our feelings. Uh, likewise, taking one positive action won't change our behavior. Taking one positive action won't change our behavior. Fasting once doesn't automatically turn into a discipline of fasting. Uh, having a good personal time with God today doesn't ensure that it's going to happen tomorrow. Giving once doesn't translate into the character of generosity. Just like mindsets are developed by thinking the same thoughts over and over, over time, 
Habits are developed by taking the same actions over time. Consider this. Uh, we started the, this process by looking at the fruit, um, the fruit of the change. So think about this. Which, which will be more rewarding, the fruit of a deed or the fruit of a habit? The, the habit's going to produce a lot more fruit than, than one deed. So if we believe if we believe in the fruit of making a change, we should repeat those positive actions until they become habit. If we believe in the fruit of a change, we should repeat those positive actions until they become habit. Let's look at Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. All right. For most of the changes that we're going to make, we're going to experience, the, the fruit and the blessings of those changes come at the end, the, the action side of it, not at the side where we're starting to change our thoughts about it. Uh, we need to put um, positive changes into practice. Practice means we keep doing it, not just doing it once. Um, until they become part of us. So, uh, accountability can be a great help to us in this po process of repeating these, these positive actions to, to make a change. Um, accountability is good motivation when you know that someone you trust will inspect what you've done. And uh, if you anticipate, you kind of know your history, if, if you think you might lose motivation at the sooner end rather than later, ask for accountability at the beginning when you're just starting it and instead of waiting until you get stuck and then asking for accountability because then you've got to go through the whole motivation process again. So that accountability can help keep the ball rolling until it becomes a positive habit in our lives. So we should remember the idea for a change is only the catalyst to get the process rolling, not the end product. The idea for a change is only the catalyst to get the process rolling, it's not the end product. Therefore, um, when we're confronted with a change, and we absolutely will be, happens all the time, we need to give it to the whole process if we want to enjoy the fruit of that change. So next change that comes, give it to this whole process if you want to experience the blessings of it. Let me end with one more quote. If you don't change the direction you're going, then you're likely to end up where you're heading. Let's pray.